we're in the Psalm series, and we have a couple things that we do in the Psalm series. We have a scripture reciter instead of a reader, um, and we also have talented artists in our church that depict the Psalms so we can see them as a psalmist or as the reciter is reciting it. And so Brendan Businger um, provided the artwork this week, and so it'll be up on the screens. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is that we have a guest preacher today, and I'm excited uh, to have him in the room because um, he has... Uh, just a unique gift and a calling for preaching, and he has uh, invested in uh, Andrew and I and other pastors in the City Light family. Uh, so we have Tom Rempel with us today from Lincoln, and just a little history, just so you know, Tom has been preaching or pastoring for 50 years, um, so he's got a little more experience than some of us who are usually up here. Um, and he is also, he planted a church in about, I think it's 1993, he planted Faith Bible Church in Lincoln, pastored faithfully. Um, recently, he stepped out of that role, but he's not retired because he goes around and he blesses churches by preaching almost every week. He is also just a mentor to young pastors and preachers, and he's become, kind of become a spiritual father to uh, the, the City Light Church pastors, and so uh, really grateful for him. Uh, he might mention this, but he also uh, doesn't do stuff solo. He's got a wife that he's been married to for, I think, 56 years. Um, he's also got, uh, there's uh, three kids, nine grandkids, and eight great-grandkids. And so he's got a little life experience. He's walked faithfully with Jesus. Um, if you talk to this guy, he's just a, a, Jesus just overflows out of him. So we're excited about that. Um, excited to have him here to share with us from Psalm 62. Uh, so I'd uh, love to invite you to stand up. We're going to hear Psalm 62 recited to us by Alice Schwartz, and then Tom is going to come up and preach the same passage. Psalm 62. To the choir master, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Of all the scripture is his ancient collection of 150 hymns that generation after generation has turned to in times of trouble, fear, and despair. These are more than simple, pithy, devotional expressions. They are treasures of wisdom to be heard and contemplated, interpreted, and applied. The invitation to read the Psalms begins in the very first one. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the law, he meditates day and night. As a result of that, he's like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water. It bears its fruit in its season, and its, wither, its leaves do not wither. Psalms are part of the wisdom collection of the Old Testament. The psalm is wisdom. In my 74th year, I have grown to appreciate the psalms more than ever. It seems over the last two to five years, I've been there time and again and have read it all the way through countless times. It's God's gift to us to help us understand how to navigate 
peacefully through the troubled waters of our circumstances and our times. Wisdom is simply the learned art and ability of putting into practice, applying the things, the truth that we know for certain. How does what I know to be true apply to the situation that I find myself in? Uh, This particular one, Psalm 62, is one of uh, 75 treasures of David's that just flowed from his heart. When you read the the Psalms, it's almost like you have the privilege of, of taking somebody's personal private journal and reading it. And in doing so, you see their heart and their struggles, and you see the resolution of their faith. Psalm 62 begins with, to the choir master, according to Jedithon. Jedithon, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, is one of the key worship leaders that David appointed for the tabernacle, and his sons are actually joining him in ministry. So David writes this particular hymn, and he gives it to the messengers, and now take that to Jedithon, and let's sing this one at the tabernacle. It begins in a stunning way. And again, the, the Psalms are, are poems. They, they are to be read uh, poetically and rhythmically. They're, they're, not, they're not to be outlined in all, but to, to create a framework, we just kind of imposed kind of a, some, some markers along the way to help us follow our way through this particular Psalm. The first one is the testimony. It's, it is David's settled conviction. Notice verse 1, for God alone my soul waits in silence. The most offensive word in the Scripture is W-A-I-T. It's a four-letter word that demands patience. For God alone, my soul waits. The problem with God's timetable is that it is perfect, but it's not the same as ours. Patience has to be a gift of the Spirit, or we would not experience it at all. But here at the beginning, David begins this hymn. He's going to minister to the congregation over whom he is the king, and he wants them on Saturday to sing this, for God alone my soul, that's the inner man, waits in silence. Silence means it waits with a quiet spirit a calmness of heart, an unshakable confidence. Why? Because I'm waiting for God. Notice, from Him comes my salvation. The word salvation has to do with God stepping in and rescuing us from a dire circumstance, sometimes stepping in and cutting loose the chains of addictions and slavery to sin, things like that, sometimes rescuing us from oppression, sometimes getting us out of problems we ourselves got ourselves into. Other times it's God showing up at difficult times that had nothing to do with our own initiation, and yet we desperately need someone to come and pull us out. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock, my salvation, and my fortress. Therefore, I will not be greatly shaken. Those terms. I, again, the last couple of weeks I've read from Psalm 1 to Psalm 150 twice. And, and after all of these years of loving the Psalms and all, suddenly, I'm a little slow, but suddenly I realized that of the 11 Psalm writers that we know by name, only David uses these expressions. He uses them over and over again, and I, 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 you see them so often that I've started to think that all of the psalm writers talked about the rock, the refuge, and the fortress, but it's unique to David. The rock, it means something that is unmoving, is certain, is solid. You can stand on it and stand firm. Refuge, it, it, it means a place of safety. It is a shelter in the midst of a storm. It's protection in turbulent times. But a fortress, a fortress is is a walled enclosure that protects you from the front and the back and all of the sides. So David declares that God has… Now, he lifts these pictures from his own experience. 
in 1 Samuel chapter 23. In order to appreciate the Psalms, you need to slow down a little bit and read the story of the life of David because all of his hymns are written in the context of a situation, a circumstance in which he finds himself. And in the 23rd of 1 Samuel, Saul has been chasing David relentlessly. And it says there, and David went down to the rock. And so he takes that real thing, that tangible thing, and he describes it as God. He's looking for a fortress place. So as you begin to understand this psalm, he is, I think in these circumstances, he is talking about the days of running for his life from Saul. Remember that Saul was the people's choice. He was not God's choice. God gave them what they deserved, and then later, after 40 years, he would give them what he wanted to give them, and that was a great King David. So Saul's been rejected, and his family line's been rejected by God. Samuel has been sent out to anoint the next future king of Israel. He comes to the home of Jesse, and the first son comes into the home, and he looks every inch to be a king, and Samuel's all about ready to pour the oil on him, and the Spirit of God says, no, that's not the one. The second one comes in, that's not the one. The fifth one comes in, that's not the one. Finally, he's down to the seventh one, and the Spirit says, it's not that one. And he looks at Jesse, and he says, so, you have any others? He says, oh, duh. I forgot all about it. David out in the sheepfolds. And so David comes in, and he is anointed by Samuel to become the king of Israel at a future time. But in between there, you've got that whole event where he goes out and visits his brothers in the battlefield, and there's this great nine-foot giant from, uh, from the Philistines, and he's taunting the people of God, and, and uh, David's like looking at his brothers, why didn't somebody shut him up? And nobody would, so he says, I'll do it myself. And he goes and he conquers Goliath, and then all of a sudden, he's poster boy number one in the nation, and so all the young women are, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands, and all of a sudden, this jealous spirit arrests the heart of the king and he's threatened by David, and he begins to chase him, and he spends almost a decade and a half chasing him through the hills and in the woods and all of those things. It got so bad that at one point, David actually went to the hometown of Goliath. There couldn't be a more, the only more dangerous place for David to be at that season of life would have been in the palace with Saul, who was not really great with a spear. Twice he threw a spear at a guy playing a harp and missed him. That's the kind of commander you want in charge of your military. Actually, he threw one at his son Jonathan at a dinner table, and he missed him as well. But that would be a dangerous place. But the second most dangerous place would be for David to be in the hometown of Goliath. Their king, Achish, David starts feigning like he's insane or something, drooling in his beard and all. And, and they go in and they say, hey, you know, David who killed Saul is here. And the king goes, I got enough madmen. Why are you bringing me another madman? When David was there in the second most place, he said, chapter 56, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. Many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. I will not be greatly shaken. I want you to notice that David prays boldly a statement of trust. This is what I am currently doing before God answers the prayer. His trials are described in verse 3. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall or a, a tottering fence. It is like literally a leaning wall, a tottering fence. He described it as, your goal is to crush me, to terminate me, to kill me. How long are you going to do that? And then he goes on to say, they take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. What is he talking about? I think in this time, he's talking about not now that Saul's chasing him, but now he's been anointed the king of Israel. And 
But over time, his son Absalom has won the heart of the people away to himself, stood at the gates when people came and they wanted a, a judicial decision made. He would say, oh, don't, you don't want to go into them. I'll decide this for you. And he bought the favor of the people until finally he decided to assert himself. And David's advisor said, you need to leave the city because the people are backing your son Absalom. And David's closest friends, they said one thing to him and they did another. They were duplistic and dishonest and hypocritical. And so he says to them, they take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. That's his trial. It goes on and on. He said the same thing in chapter 13 of the Psalms. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Some of you are living there right now. Some of you are saying, is this ever going to end? Is this struggle ever going to go away? Will the Will the hold of this addiction ever be broken on my soul? What is the financial trial I'm in? Will it ever come to an end? How long, O oh Lord? The truth is, is that God may not choose to remove your trial immediately, but he will promise to carry you through it. David said, how long? And then notice, there's this five-letter word, and it's in italics, and most people just read right past it and don't even see it, but it's the word selah. There's a lot of discussion about what that means, and most musicians says that it's some kind of a musical pause. When I was a young child growing up in South Dakota, we had, we had a, an itinerant preacher that would stay with our family periodically. He was a blind man, therefore all his sermons were memorized, obviously, but I can remember, I was like a third grader or maybe fourth grader, and we were sitting at the dining room table, and, and uh, Pastor Billy and my dad were discussing the Psalms, and they were asking about what does this word Selah mean, and I, I'd never forgotten what he said. The word Selah, he says, when you hit it, just say, hmm, well, I'll think of that. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but in their way, they curse. Hmm. Well, think of that. Now notice David does some self-talk. Verse 5. For God alone, it sounds almost like verse 1, but it's different. In verse 1, he is declaring that in the face of his trials, he will continue to trust the Lord. My heart is at peace. My soul is at rest. I am quiet on the inside because I'm resting in God. But then he reviews his circumstances, and they are not getting better going away. So now he instructs himself to do what he said he was going to do. Verse 5, for God alone, my soul, wait in silence. So, so, so quiet the anxiety and the agitation. You said you were going to wait on the Lord. Now wait in the Lord. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Mom, God, rest my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge. Notice, notice how rich this is and how personal. How many times in verse 1 he talked about my soul, my salvation, my rock, my salvation, my fortress here, my soul, my hope, my rock, my salvation, my fortress, my salvation, my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Great preacher from the last century. He was a medical doctor in London, and then he was called out of medical practice to become a pastor. And uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones made this statement, most of our unhappiness is because we are listening to ourselves rather than talking to ourselves. We're, we're believing all of the anxiety of our mind and our heart, and rather than pause and instruct ourselves to trust in the Lord, we continue to believe what we're hearing. Trust in the Lord at all times. So, David, 
I just, just personalize it. And my wife gave me permission this morning to use her as an illustration. So uh, oftentimes I'll, I'll come home and uh, she'll be in the kitchen either making sourdough bread or preparing a meal for one of several grandchildren who may stop by after their class at the university and, and all of that. And, and she'll also be talking, and I'm never quite sure if she's talking to me or is she talking to the dog. We, we babysit our granddaughter's dog every day, Keen Eye, or does she have her her ear pod in and she's talking to somebody on the phone. But inevitably I'll walk down the hall and I'll answer and she'll say, you don't understand, I'm self-employed and right now I'm in the middle of a staff meeting and your contribution is not necessary. <laughs> so that's what he's talking about here. David's having a staff meeting, he's self-employed and he's talking to himself saying, no, trust in the Lord. But I want you to notice that as the king responsible for the people, the mark of a great leader is number one, is number one ministry of a leader, whether it's a pastor, an elder, or somebody in the business world, is to lead by example. And so what David is saying to the people is, I myself, they can see the trials, they know the struggles, but he's telling them, I will continue to trust in the Lord. And he reminds himself to do that. But then notice in verse 8, he adds them in. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. And now he shifts it. God is a refuge for us. Trust in him at all times. Notice chapter 42 of the Psalms. Chapter 42, it just repeats this phrase. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? That's listening to yourself. Now it's talking to yourself. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He says the same thing in verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Again, listening to himself rather than talking to himself. Why are you in turmoil within me? Talks to himself. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Notice chapter 43, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. His instruction to them is trust in him. Notice the emphasis there, at all times. Not just sometimes. Not just when it seems logical. Not when it seems like I've got no other option. But whatever comes your way, he says, trust in him at all times. Our responsibility, as those who know the Lord, is to be leaning on him continually. To lean on him, to trust in him, means in, in, when I was a youth pastor, I used to illustrate it by sliding a chair out until I finally fell on the platform. At age 74, it's probably not highly advisable. But it, it basically, to trust in the Lord is to depend so much on him that if somebody pulls this out, I fall flat. There's nothing else. I'm, I'm not reserving. I'm leaning on me, and I'm leaning a little on him. He instructs them, lean on him completely at all times, and cry out to him. Pour out your heart to him. Call on him. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. It says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice verse 6. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that he can exalt you at the proper time, casting all of your anxiety upon him because you are his concern. He cares for you. David instructs them to lean on the Lord, cry out to the Lord, and to hide in the Lord. God is a refuge. He is a four-walled protection for us. No one can touch us. And then he throws in this Selah. Hmm. Well, think of that. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Well, think of that. And then he moves to a teaching. In verse 9 and 10, those of low estate, that is the humble people, the non-influential, the, the ones we would just pass by and not give a second thought to, are but a breath. Uh, how important are they? They're just here today, gone tomorrow. Did a funeral yesterday, read from Psalm 90, the Psalm of Moses. I love that one. It's the only one that we know that, Psalm, that Moses wrote for sure. And Moses lived to be 120 years old. But in that psalm, he says that life is short, it's just a breath. Our lives will be 70 years, and if by 
by strength, 80, which means I'm living on borrowed time even now. It's like, we're just a breath. Life comes and life goes. If you live to be 101 like my aunt did, or you die at age 28 like my daughter did, the fact is, whatever the length of your life is, it's just a breath. But even for the high and influencer, those of high estate, they're just a delusion. Notice, in the balances, they go up. So if you, if you put trusting in man or trusting in God on the old-fashioned scale, God will outweigh it every time, every time. Don't want to get political. I don't think we're recording, are we? I can pull you off. Anyway. <laughs> you know, the psalm says that some men trust in horses and some in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, we're in an election cycle again. And, and we're all getting all ramped up going, you know, God's only way to save our nation is through a man. No, the only way he's going to save is God himself has to do it. That's what he's talking about here. If, if, even, even the most influential and the powerful, if you put them on a scale and you put trusting in God on the other side, immediately God outweighs them all. It's like going to an old-fashioned park where they actually have a teeter-totter. You remember those things? You put one side on the other, and then you get going pretty soon. And then to get even with your buddy, when you're down, you jump off, and he smacks it down like that. What are talking about? So you, you put God and, and man, the, the best of men, on a scale, on a teeter-totter, and God will outweigh them every time. Then he says, but put no trust in extortion, or set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. We have a tendency to believe that our security is found either in man or in money. Over and over, I wrote these references in the margin of my Bible. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. Proverbs 11, 28. Proverbs 18, 11. Over and over, he says that a rich man's wealth is his tower of security in his own imagination. There's no protection there at all. Psalm 49 says, why should I fear in times of trouble? When the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That he should live on forever and never see the pit, man in his pomp will not remain is like the beast that perish. Psalm 52. You see the man who would not make God his refuge, but he trusted in the abundance of his riches. He sought refuge in his own destruction. His teaching is don't trust man and don't trust money. Instead, trust God. So he restates the truth at the end. It's almost like a prayer breathed out. Once God has spoken, and twice I have heard this. The Lord has spoken to the heart of David, and it's just like it's echoing in his memory that one, power belongs to God, not to man, not to money, but to God. Two, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. As you're reading Psalms, I hope you just just read Psalm 1 to Psalm 150. Every time you see that phrase, steadfast love, highlight it. I think you're going to find it occurs at least 127 times. Steadfast love means solid, guaranteed loyalty, faithfulness, trustworthiness. That love, God will sacrifice of himself to meet my need, and he does it consistently and faithfully, steadfast love. Actually, one author said that it appears 250 times in the Old Testament. The secret to our trusting in the Lord is that His steadfast love never fails. But then he wraps it up by saying, for you will render to a man according to his work. No kind deed or gracious act you ever did was not noticed by God. But no assault or violence against you or abuse was ever inflicted, but what that God did not keep the record. And there is coming a day when the righteous judge will do justice. So as David wraps this up with this promise to trust the Lord, instructing himself to trust the Lord, urging his people to trust the Lord, 
You say, well, so this, how is his prayer answered? Is this trial and the struggle goes on and on? And the answer to his prayer is stated in the person of Jesus in Psalm 110, verse 1, where he says, my Lord said to the Lord, be seated at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Ultimately, there is one who will be all-powerful. Jesus proved to be that when he broke the chains of the grave. On Saturday, on Silent Saturday, the devil and the demons danced victoriously on what they thought was an occupied tomb, only to find out on Sunday that he had broken the chains and he'd been set free. Steadfast love. Was there anyone who can love me in spite of how bad I am and unlovable I am? There is one. God so loved the world that he gave the one and only son that he had that whosoever would believe in him would never perish, but would always have everlasting life. Will there ever be justice? Will righteousness ever rule? Yes, there is one. The ultimate judge of all times will be Jesus when he is seated on the throne, and those who have trusted in him will judge righteously with him. In the final days of my daughter's losing battle with cancer. She was 28 years old. Uh, she spoke to the Faith Bible Church family one Sunday, and she said these things. I'm so glad that I had so much time before being sick to soak up so much scripture and truth because I am using so much of it now. When the team goes back to the locker room at halftime, recognizing that they are too weak to face their opponent, it's too late to head to the weight room and build strength for the second half of the game. Now, preparation long before the game began was needed to build up the strength that victory in the struggle will require. The time to prepare for the trials of life is now, before the real battles begin. In the last weeks of her life, she would get up early in the morning, about five in the morning before her babies and her husband were out of bed, and she had this magnificent big window on the east side of their living room. As the sun came up, she would sit with her Bible open and read in light of the sunrise, Psalm 73. I'm continually with you. You hold my hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. He is my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. We titled this, the only psalm. Notice in verse 1, for God alone my soul waits. Verse 2, he alone is my rock and my salvation. Verse 5, for God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. Verse 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. Those four words are the same word in the original language. And each of those is the first word in the sentence. Only for God my soul waits. Only He is my rock. Only God shall my soul wait. Only He is my rock and my salvation. Will there ever be one who has the power to overcome the trials and the tribulations that we're facing? Will there ever be one who unfailingly will love us though we are faithless to him? Will there ever be one who will righteously judge? There is one. His name is Jesus. Selah. Well, think of that.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and 